You know, in spite of our best efforts, sometimes all we create is a fine mess. You ever feel that way? As much as you want to do things the right way, and you think you're, you're using the best uh, tactics to be able to accomplish something, things get worse. Well, let, let me illustrate this by a rather silly two-minute video so you can see what I mean. Good afternoon. Is this the home of Professor Noodle? It is. Well, we've come to sweep his chimney. Another nice mess you've gotten me into. I would bet that's the first time some of our younger people have ever seen Laurel and Hardy. That's another fine mess you've gotten me into. You know, Sometimes it seems like all we do, in spite of our best efforts, is get ourselves into more and more despair, more and more trouble, more and more difficulties. We're here to tell you something this morning. We're here to let you know that God has identified himself in a number of ways. He gives us his name, and there are 21 different names of God in the Old Testament. We're in a series of sermons where we're examining eight of those names of God. This morning, we want to talk about the fact that Jehovah Titzkenu is our righteousness. Our God is righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. This is the third in our series on the names of God. Now, I need you to know something. Let's go to that next slide, the photo slide. Yeah, the next slide. There you go. You just saw... Oliver Hardy on the left and Stan Laurel on the right. And yes, it was slapstick. Yes, it was a lot of physical comedy. Uh, they weren't the only ones back in the earlier part of the 20th century that, that entertained people this way. But I really want you to pay attention to that photo. Now, of course, you know that Oliver Hardy was always the one who seemed to know everything. And, and Stan Laurel, the one on the right, was the one who seemed to be the bumpkin. But I really want you to take a look at Stan's face. Because in spite of our best efforts, in spite of what we try to do, we often do make a fine mess of things, don't we? And that's how we feel. That's, that, that, that's the emotion that we sometimes have to deal with when we think we're doing something 
in order to make an improvement somewhere, and everything just falls apart. Let's face it, we've all made a mess of things. And because we've all made a mess of things, we need rescued, and we need repaired. Now, how in the world do we do that? We don't do it. God does it. He is able to rescue us because his name means the Lord, our righteousness. God is our righteousness. Jehovah uh, Tiskenu, this is one of the hardest ones to pronounce. Out of all those Hebrew names, this is one of the harder ones. Jehovah Tiskenu means that God has promised his righteousness. He has promised to send a king who would personally animate and personally give us, personify his own righteousness. And that king is Jesus Christ. Phil Cross, a a Christian songwriter, wrote a song that says, with only three nails and two pieces of wood and with one rugged cross, Jesus built a bridge. You see, he became our righteousness. He fixed the things that we could not fix. He gives us the ability to cross the chasm and the valley and the ravine that we have created by our own sin. Through Jesus Christ, God's righteousness, first of all, relieves stress. God's righteousness relieves stress. There's two passages of Scripture I want, I, I want us to look at. Uh, the first is uh, actually Jeremiah 23, and I, I, that's uh, written wrong on the, uh, uh, on the slide. I, I, I realized that I made that mistake when I shared this last night. But in, in, in Jeremiah 23 and in Jeremiah 33, you might want to turn to that and hold it for just a moment. Let me talk a little bit about Jeremiah before we look to see what he said on behalf of God. Jeremiah was God's prophet during a very bleak time in his Israel's history. Israel and Judah were already divided kingdoms. Judah was already taken captive and they were gone. All that was left was, was, or Israel was taken captive and gone. All that was left was Judah. And here Judah was with Jerusalem in their center and they were under attack. Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet because of the distress and because of the trouble and because of the heartache that was going on in his nation and in his capital city, Jerusalem, at the time of his ministry. Not only that, King Zedekiah had thrown Jeremiah into prison because Jeremiah criticized the king. The Babylonians were attacking Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was losing. Jeremiah's world was in chaos. There was a fine mess everywhere. And in spite of this, Jeremiah knew that better days were ahead because God's righteousness relieves stress. God used Jeremiah to promise the people that rescue was coming through the Messiah, through the promised one of God, who would be just and right. And his very name described safety and security for God's people. The name of this rescuer according to Jeremiah, is the Lord our righteousness. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 23, look at verses 3 through 6. Here we have Jeremiah speaking on God's behalf, and he says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock uh, out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will, place one, I will place shepherds over them who will tend to them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up uh, to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely, and uh, to, do, to do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. That's who the Savior is. That's who the branch of David is. And then a little later in Jeremiah 33, we have these words in verses 14 through 16. 
He continues this thought. He says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I have made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it is called the Lord, our righteousness. We can't be right by ourselves and of ourselves. We need to understand that when we try to do things and make a mess, all we have around us is stress. What's the Bible mean when it talks about God being righteous? Well, God is always one who is going to act in accordance with what is right. Now, we need to think about that. When God is always declaring himself as righteous, no action of God can ever be wrong or even slightly wrong. And yet, when things go upside down in our lives, when we face all sorts of trouble and distress and we wonder which end is up, how often do we shake our fist at God? And we want to yell at him, and we want to blame him. But please understand, if God is our righteousness, he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't need an eraser. He doesn't need a delete tab on a computer screen. We may not understand it, but God, but all that God does is right. It's righteous. And he is not wasting our time. Too many people give up on God too soon. They forget that he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. And they think he should stop us from ever walking in the valley of the shadow of death. We give up on God too soon. God is our righteousness. And when our lives are in chaos, God provides three ways to sweep away this stress. First of all, from the scriptures we looked at, he looks to the end result. You know, when we're stressed out, almost always our focus is on the present mess that we're in. But when we turn our focus to the end result, our hearts become lighter. When we are stressed out, we need to look. And we need to look hard at a cross, a cross that is empty. The cross is empty because Jesus died and was buried. But the grave is empty because Jesus lives for us and lives forever. There is life on the other side of our stress. There is hope. There, is, there are answers. And God is there in the midst of it. We need to look beyond the mess we're in and realize that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. Secondly, we need to trust in God's promises. Look to the end result, but then trust in God's promises. When we're stressed, it is so easy for us to forget God's promises, to forget what he has already declared. We need to remind ourselves of what God has already said by knowing his word, and by trusting his promises. And third, we need to dump our self-righteousness. We, we need to get rid of that. We often think that somehow, by our own means and by our own abilities, we are going to be earning God's favor. We hope we can go to heaven by being good people. Well, that's being self-righteous. But the scriptures are very clear. Paul said in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. We're told that our righteousness compared to God looks like a filthy rag. And so we cannot earn our way into heaven. The only righteousness that gets us to heaven is the Lord our righteousness. Jesus Christ is the only means. And if we belong to Jesus Christ, we claim his righteousness and we understand that he is with us. And so please, let's be sure that we understand that God's righteousness relieves stress. But secondly, God's righteousness renews the heart. And this is a beautiful passage from the prophet Ezekiel. Over in Ezekiel, in chapter uh, 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, I want to look at verses 24 through 27. Here again, we have the name of God being the Lord our righteousness. But what's he do now? He renews the heart. He gives us a new heart. He gives us something that we have always needed. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 27. Ezekiel, speaking on God's behalf, said, For I will take 
you out of the nations. I will gather you from the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws because the Lord is righteous. A new heart I give you. I give you something fresh and brand new. God gives us a way of escape. When we become cold and calloused and when our hearts become as hard as stone, God gives us a new heart. Now, how do we contrast the new heart with the old heart or with the heart that we really already have? The old heart is alienated from God, but the new heart clings to God with all the affection and love we can give Him. The old heart is sold out to sin, but the new heart is redeemed from all wickedness because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. The old heart comes along with or runs side by side with sin and the ways of the world. But the new heart, the new heart is led by the Spirit of God. The new heart looks to life and to peace. Now, if you have the choice between having an old heart that's rock hard and a brand new heart that is flesh and warm and pumping and vibrant, which would you want? If you go to, to, to the, the doctor and he says, you need a heart procedure and we can fix this, even if it meant a transplant and you would live and you would be, be uh, celebrating your life for many more years, wouldn't you say, you know, that's worth it? It's worth it? God gives us a new heart by freeing us from the things that have enslaved us with our old heart. And the one thing that has enslaved us is our sin. We just sang a song this morning. What can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus frees us from sin. He accomplished it by the unspeakable gift he's given when he died for our sins. He accomplished it by conquering our fear of the grave. He accomplished it by his personal presence in us in our hearts, through His Holy Spirit. And He accomplished this, the freedom of slavery to sin, by renewing our resolve, our commitment to live for Him. God's new heart in us. God, our righteousness, changes everything. It changes our desires. It changes our affections. It changes our very purpose for life. Because God gives us a new heart and gives us a new way of living. And so God's righteousness removes stress. God's righteousness renews the heart. But ultimately, God's righteousness reconciles relationships. That's who he is. And that's what he does. He reconciles relationships. Turn over to, to the New Testament, to Second Peter. I'm sorry, not Second Peter. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 17 through 21. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the the latter half, the second part of this chapter, is all dealing with the ministry of reconciliation, with how God reconciles us to himself. But he does it through his righteousness, and I want to key in on the last part of what Paul says about God's reconciliation. Uh, Actually, he begins introducing this in verse 11, but we want to go down to verse 17. Because this is where he comes to a conclusion. He's already explained some of this. And so there's that famous word in Paul's vocabulary, therefore. If there's a therefore, there's a reason it's therefore. And so you read the earlier verses and you understand what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that God reconciles himself to us. And then... He says, therefore, if, in this is verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become, get this, the righteousness of God. The Lord our righteousness. Because of the righteousness of God, we can be reconciled. Now, what's reconcile mean? We use the word, we throw it around a lot. According to Webster's Dictionary, reconcile can be uh, explained as restoring friendship or harmony. And then a second definition is to settle or to resolve. We restore friendship and harmony with God. We restore friendship and harmony with one another. Secondly, we settle or resolve whatever is a conflict in our lives. And the biggest conflict we have in our lives is sin. God is our reconciliation. He is the one who brings us back to him. So with that in mind, what, what, what kind of relationship does God want to have with us? If we are reconciled to God, and if we are to be sharing his reconciliation with others, Paul's very clear here. He says, then you need to be his ambassadors. You need to be his ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who speaks on behalf of his home, his or her home country. They speak on behalf of their country's leader. In our case, it would be the President of the United States. There are goodwill ambassadors. They, we have an ambassador to the United Nations, and then we have ambassadors in all the, the countries that we are in good relationships with, and even with some countries we're not in such good relationships with. We have ambassadors who live on United States government property in that foreign land. We call it the embassy. And that person who is the ambassador is appointed to speak on behalf of the President of the United States and to speak on behalf of the entire country of the United States of America. The ambassador doesn't speak what he thinks or what she thinks the way it should be. They only voice what their leader says. And that's what we're to be. We don't turn around and interpret the Scriptures different ways. We voice it the way the Scriptures declare it. And we speak on behalf of God. We live on behalf of God. We show the reconciliation that God has had between us and Him. And by doing that, we have the right and the authority to share that reconciliation with others. Because God has made that kind of difference in our lives. His righteousness has taken over our lives when all we do is create fine messes. You see, true reconciliation brings about change. And that change is needed. Far too many people who have been Christians have inflicted more pain and more difficulty upon the church by not living for Jesus Christ, but by living for themselves. I'm a Christian, but I'm going to darn well do what I please, thank you. I'm going to live my way. I'm going to ignore what the scriptures say. And I'm going to ignore this, this person I call my Lord. And we do more damage to the kingdom of God and to the local church by living our own way. We're ambassadors. We've been reconciled. And we can express and share God's righteousness because that righteousness has given us this privilege and this opportunity. When people see us and when they hear us, do they want what we have? Or are they avoiding us like the Ebola plague? We have to consider how we are representing Jesus in our daily lives. Not just in a worship service, but in the nitty gritty when difficulties arise. You see, Jesus is at the very heart of Christianity. And he is at the heart of righteousness and reconciliation. And it's only through Jesus that we can get out of the fine mess that we've gotten ourselves into. Here's how we sum it up, folks. All people sin, and all people fall short of God's glory. 
But here's the good news. God freely makes us righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. He makes us righteous as we commit ourselves to Jesus. With only three nails and two pieces of wood and one rugged cross, Jesus built a bridge. And that bridge is called righteousness. And we traverse that bridge to come to him, to listen to him, to obey him. We cannot be a part of the flock of God unless we are listening and following the shepherd because he is our righteousness. He removes stress. He gives us a new heart. And he is our righteousness. He is the one who renews. Oh, that's what we need. And that's what this world is desperate for. And so let's see Jesus, the branch of David, the one descended down the line, the one eternally promised, who will make a difference in our lives, in our relationships, in our families, and in his church. The Lord is our righteousness, and we need that. And so we invite you to come to Christ today. If you're outside of his love and grace, we invite you. It's his extension. It's his hand offered to you to know him as the one who makes all things new and gives you the heart you've always wanted. You come to Christ. You obey him. You're filled with him. He is our righteousness. Let's stand together. And if you need to make that kind of decision, we invite you to step forward this morning as we sing this song. Lord, let us shine with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not by anything we do, but by letting him shine through us and through your spirit. Guide us. And we pray, Father, we will live for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.